It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 258 of Science on Top. Today is Sunday, the 26th of March, 2016. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Dr. Shane Joseph. Hello. And Penny Dumsday. Hello. And before we begin, I think we should probably make a little apology. You may have noticed that we kind of disappeared for the last two weeks. Uh, It's just busy people and hard to get everyone uh, on at the same time sometimes. But we soldier on, and today we're going to be talking about tracing the Indigenous Australians' migration to and around Australia and the dark matter of the microbial world. But first, let's talk about wild elephants. And a team of researchers from South Africa, Botswana and the United States have published a paper in the journal PLOS One showing that wild elephants only have about two hours of sleep each night. Penny, as a mother with small children, does this make you somewhat jealous of the elephants? I was going to say a rude two word. Hours? Yeah, two hours. <laughs> no, well, my children, thank goodness, have grown out of that stage. But I was like, really? Two hours? <laughs> and you know what? Is they don't even necessarily do that all in one go. Ah, fits and stuff. So maybe they do. Maybe we do have a lot more in common between human children and elephants than we I'm do. actually so no. jealous of these elephants, seriously. So <laughs> jealous. That they oh, only you know, get much, that much sleep or that they can survive so well. That they only need elephants. that much sleep. Yeah. I would yeah. love to be able to function on just two hours of sleep. It'd be great. <laughs> well, it's, yeah. it's really interesting because um, captive elephants apparently sleep for three to seven hours. And mm. seven is getting pretty normal, I feel. Mm-hmm. Um, well, it's not optimal, normal, yeah. I should say. Human. It's very optimal. But, um, yeah, I guess, you know, different animals are different. Blah. So here's two interesting things I found about this. First of all, is you can't, you know, you can't really use electrodes with elephants to <laughs> measure if they're asleep or not. But because I they're... would love to see someone try. <laughs> Their skulls are too thick. So wow, I mean, okay. when I was in uni, I liked to get an extra $50, $100 by participating in sleep experiments. And, you know, they just stick the electrodes onto your skull and you can see, oh, here, you know, you look at, the readout and there you were in REM sleep and you've got all those different kinds of ways, but you just can't do that for an elephant. So what they did instead was fit motion sensors to the elephant's trunks and the trunk is the most active part of the elephant's body and it's very, it's if the animal's awake, it's usually moving. So what they did is they figured that if they haven't used their trunk for five minutes, it's probably asleep. So yeah. using this proxy for measuring sleep, um, they found that elephants slept for about two hours a night in four or five short bursts, which is called polyphasic sleep. They weren't always lying down to sleep. And on for four days of the 35-day study, they didn't sleep at all. So they were awake for up to 48 hours continuously. Whoa. <laughs> so why, yeah. why are they only getting this little bit of sleep? Is that because they're being woken up by predators or they're alert and watching for predators or something? Yeah, so the idea was that when they were awake a lot, they were also travelling long distances. Maybe they were avoiding predators or poachers, but then Ah. they didn't have a big sleep afterwards. So this is not the world's most... It was only two elephants. It's not the world's most detailed, Mm. you know, humongous study, but it, it probably gives a reasonably... Like it's not, there's no, nothing to indicate that it's... It's the, the best study we've got so out. far. Yeah, so, exactly. <laughs> As far as we know, it is going to yeah. be typical of all of them, but there's a chance it isn't. But it is very interesting because if they do sleep this little, and it's, it's questionable because that trunk, prox, that tr- movement mm. of their trunk proxy might not be the best way. For example, um, animals like cows can stand up, have their eyes a bit open and even chew their cud when they're asleep in non-REM REM sleep. Well, even humans so, will move around in our sleep as well. Yeah, exactly. So mm. it could be that they're sleeping a bit more than this mm. but still moving. But it still, is interesting. It, I mean, if they do have this short sleep, they're having lot, very little rapid eye movement sleep. Mm-hmm. And 
from what I thought is I thought that was quite important for dreaming and memory. And that just struck me as odd because I don't know if this is actually scientific or just a thing, but I thought elephants were known for remembering, you know, among the animal kingdom. You beat me to the joke that I was going to do, which was that an elephant never forgets. Yeah. (laughs) I don't know how accurate that is either. But um, it's also interesting, I think, that that even when they were walking for four days or whatever and they Mm. didn't, they didn't have that big binge sleep at the end of it, which is kind of what I use weekends for, making up for all the sleep I didn't get during the working week, <laughs> which I also think scientifically doesn't actually hold up, but it seems to work a little bit. But uh, they don't have that catch-up sleep, so they just, they've just they adapted to function on a little bit of sleep, I guess. It's very cool. Mm. be interesting to know what other, if other animals have a similar kind of, other wild animals have a similar kind of sleep pattern. Well, or, apparently you know, horses only need about three hours of sleep. Mm. But, um, wild, uh, um, wild health oh, like horses wild as well horses. as... No, yeah, I yeah. don't know. Giraffes but that is actually, five? That is actually a relevant point, though, yeah. the difference between captive and mm. wild. Like yeah. I said, I mean, if you're in the wild, you've got predators that you're constantly on alert for, whereas in captive in captivity, you've got plenty of food, you're very safe, you've got the luxury Possibly of being able to sleep longer. Depressed. <laughs> yeah. I, I actually do wonder, like, if you could do a. Obviously, you can't do this study because we're not cavemen anymore. But I wonder what would have, you know, what the sleeping patterns of our ancestors would have been back when we were still, you know, hunter gatherers. If we had a similar you kind sort of sort of can do that because there are still tribes where they live very mm. similarly to how we would have lived, you know, hundred thousand years ago. Mm. But also, it's kind of intrusive to go and put the. Electrodes on their skulls. You have to <laughs> watch from a distance, reading, I guess. This is really off topic now, but I remember reading an article saying that there's sort of evidence in human writings that people used to have two sleeps. Mm. Yep. So that they'd go to sleep sort of when night fell and then mm-hmm. sort of wake up a bit later and, you know, get up and talk to people or have sex or do whatever and then go back to sleep again for their second sleep. But mm. that fell out of favour at some point. When we, when we it's, realised it's, how great it was to get eight hours of unbroken <laughs> sleep, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it I is think somewhat I contentious. To do electricity and, yeah. Yeah, yeah it, it's since we were able to manufacture daylight sort of thing that yeah. uh, the theory yeah. is that we then started having long periods of wakefulness and long periods of sleepfulness. Uh, it is a bit contentious. I think it's based on r- legal transcripts and legal records where a few people have said, and it was after second sleep that this happened or something yeah. like that. So it's mm. a little bit contentious. And it, not, all, uh, I've never looked into it. It did strike me as a bit, surely it would be. Surely it'd be better well obscure. known. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We would have read about it more often, I think. Yeah. But, anyway. uh, no, it is cool and it's interesting. And uh, I'm all in favour of as much sleep as possible. So. Oh, yes. <laughs> All right, Shane, our next story is about something that I think we've touched on over the last few years, uh, which is archaea, the microorganisms that have a lot in common with bacteria and yet they're very different. Mm. But more importantly, we know very little about archaea, uh, especially compared to how well we know bacteria, right? Yeah, pretty much. Um, So this is kind of hard to talk about because it's actually much more conceptual than anything. There's not a real experiment here that's been done. I mean, they, they, they do detail an experiment in this article that you sent us about how they discovered that we were missing a whole bunch of these archaea in, in the guts of apes, actually. But it goes beyond that because the archaea are, as I said, one of the most poorly understood domains. Well, they are the most poorly understood domain of life. Now, there are three domains of life. There are the eukaryotes, which includes us, mushrooms, etc. Um, there are bacteria, which are single-celled prokaryotic um organisms and then the the archaea which are also confusingly enough also single-celled prokaryotic organisms and by prokaryotic i mean like cellularly quite simple there's no enclosed nucleus for the dna or no little organelles there you know if you look into the inside the Mm -hmm. cell it's generally pretty simple but genetically archaea are as different to bacteria as they are to us and the reason we know that is because we've done uh, when we look at the uh, what's called the 16S ribosomal RNA gene of all animals, and that includes us, we've got a similar kind of gene. It's called the 18S, but it's, and it's got to do with its something, something to do with the gravity, the specific gravity of it. But 
the point is it's, it's an analogue. That, that gene exists in all the domains of life because mm-hmm. it's a very essential gene, and we can compare them all and say, well, how far, how closely related are they? Because this is a gene that doesn't change much over the eons. Mm-hmm. You know, obviously genes for things like, I don't know, um, well, you know, a gene that we don't we possess that a bacteria doesn't isn't 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 a good analog at all because yeah. bacteria yeah. don't have one. But, but this, this is, is a gene, common denominator amongst all of pretty life. pretty much yeah. And if you do if you sequence that gene and you compare them all, that's when they get, that, that's when you come up with this tree of life and you see that ooh, actually there's a whole bunch of things over there that are nothing like bacteria or you or eukaryotes in this gene in this gene sequence. Um, so obviously, somewhere along the line, there's been some deviation. Um, there's, there are some theories that suggest that actually archaea are a little bit more closely related to us than we are to bacteria. Oh wow! Um, yeah, it's a little bit like it's we, we share certain characteristics with them, such as I think cell membranes of, of the structures are quite are sometimes quite similar. Uh huh. But apart from that, we know very little about them because most of them haven't been grown, and also most of them, the ones that have been grown and that we do know about are these so-called extremophiles that live in mm. either, you know, hot, like salt, salt lakes or... Um, or your hot like springs or... Hot springs, thermal, thermal vents. vents. Yeah. Um, that being said, there are archaea that are very, very similar to bacteria um, phenotypically. <laughs> like, they actually are very like, sort of, you know, common. You know, they don't, they don't necessarily grow at 65 degrees. They're, some of them are quite normal. But genetically, they're just very different. Now, <laughs> the problem with this is that... We've known for a long time that, yeah, we can't grow everything in terms of bacteria. There's this off sort of bandied about figure that says we can only grow 90, we can grow 1% of organisms from any environment, such as soil, the most feces, um, water, etc. So we turn to things like sequencing from the environment. So we do, so this 16S gene I told you about, the way we isolate that in the environment is you extract DNA from a sample you use what's called a, met- a method called PCR, which essentially uses little DNA fragments of known sequences and amplifies up a gene from the environment itself. Mm-hmm. The problem is that you've got those primer sequences that we use are based on known organisms. So you get into this sort of Donald Rumsfeld-esque kind of <laughs> cycle where it's just, you're talking about the known knowns, the unknown knowns, and the unknown <laughs> unknowns. And I'm not, and that, that, that might sound really dumb, but when you think about it, if we don't know what's out there, we can't base anything, we can't sort of figure out a technique to find it based on what we know, okay? There's the quote um, in the article, you can't look for what you don't know exists. Exactly, yeah. And I remember that we, when I was doing my PhD, um, one of the PhD students, a few of the PhD students who were above me were... Um, you know, having a sort of a drunken conversation at the pub one day, and they, they, they were talking about the four, they were talking about different quadrants, and, they, and this idea came up with the fourth quadrant, which is basically what you don't know is there is isn't there. Well, sorry, what you don't know is there, and what you can't reach because what you have can't reach it. It got very philosophical and <laughs> very. Did silly, you call but... the fourth quadrant the delta quadrant? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> I hate you, Ed. <laughs> <laughs> It had to be asked. <laughs> yes. Yes, it did. It did or, or did okay. it, really. Anyway, um, did, so this is all uh, sort of very, very, you know, conceptual and a little bit hard to get your head around. But basically, what we find is when we do sequencing, so-called sequencing um, studies from the environment, it overlooks archaea because, mm-hmm. of the, because we don't know what we're looking for. Um, when you do, and, and that's even when you use so-called universal primers, which are supposed to hit everything. Like that's that you know that are based on you, you design you'll design these primers based on thousands of different sequences and say okay this region is a sim- is exactly the same is every single organism yeah. bar a couple of bases here and there which we can get around mm-hmm. but it turns out that that doesn't always hit everything so when you when these um, when these researchers I think Casey Raymond who's a microbiologist at the University of Texas they did a study on some ape poo. And they extracted DNA from ape poo, and they um, they used these so-called universal bacterial primers to find everything, and that should also find all archaea. But mm-hmm. again, this is based on the archaea that they know about. When they actually designed some primers based on just archaea, they found that these bacterial primers, these universal primers, weren't picking up all these same archaea. And that's a real problem because all of a sudden you're missing out a whole population that you, that you know is there, but you're, you, that you and they could be very important. 
but you're missing it entirely. But, so but they're, they're, they're missing that key universal denominator that everything has. Is that yeah, what you're saying? But, yeah, but in some cases they did have it. It's just that because they're also... Uh, there's another, uh, another problem where there's such low numbers... Or right. lower numbers that they get overlooked due to sheer, you know, due to sort of cherry picking, as it were, because it's a numbers game too. Like put it this way: we, if we assume that there are one, we'll say like ten to the nine cells per gram of feces, how right. many do you have to sequence to get entire coverage of all those cells? Mm, okay. Do you see what I mean? Like you have to, you have to, you have to to get full coverage of every single organism in there including the tiny little populations that may mean nothing but could also mm. have something to do with the overall, you know, phenotypic structure, you'd have to sequence 10 to the 9 times. And that's impossible. You know, that's, yeah. you know, 1 billion or whatever it is. So, yeah, <laughs> um, one, you'd have to get 1 billion sequences. That's impossible. We can't, we, we, there are enough years in, left in our lives to do that. So you go for, like, what you call big groups, but that will miss out sometimes on these archaea. And also, that, that's a numbers thing. The other problem is PCR is a notoriously finicky beast and <laughs> will sometimes just um, preferentially sequence some things over other things. Okay. It's, 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 it's sort of a, it's a dark, a dirty little secret of, <laughs> of molecular biology, but it is true. It, it does happen. So, um, that's, that's the problem with PCR. So there's a bit, there's a, bit, there's a discrepancy. So we, we're basically not studying certain groups of organisms. And this come, this is important when you look at something like, for, for example, feces. When they do these archaeal specific studies, and they they, they use the archaic uh, the archaea primers to look up these organisms, they find mostly methanogens. Now, methanogens, as the name suggests, are organisms that produce methane, and that mm-hmm. makes sense in in feces if you think about it. The gut, methane. Yep. Yep. So. If your studies are not picking up those methanogens, you're wiping them from the equation. Mm-hmm. They don't exist. And that could be totally biasing and skewing your results. Do you see what I mean? Is, you see? Uh, yeah, I, I, I get that. But if, it, if it's also a matter of we can't sequence, we can't grow them in the lab a lot of the time and sequence them necessarily, and mm. so we've kind of ignored them a lot of the time, is that... Sort of mm. also part of the problem that we've that is part, studied yeah. bacteria very thoroughly, and we know the genome of something. I think it's fifty thousand bacteria that we've got in the yeah. Joint Genome Institute, but we've only got about one thousand genomes of about archaea. That. Yes, and that's a real problem because and it's we a, can't yeah. do much about that if we can't grow them in a lab, can we? Not really. No, no. That's the, mm. that, that's the problem. That's that's where you come to the unknown unknowns. <laughs> if you can't get it in the first place. You can't base you can't base tools on it to find it in the yeah. first place. Yeah, that is the problem. You can't look look for what you don't know what you don't know exists. That's that's but, the. Exact but it also problem. sounds like this is a pretty significant thing, given that obviously we're, we're in the search for life outside of our planet, and we're looking on Mars and Enceladus and Titan and everything. Mm. But if there, there's a chance that there's Archaea there, which on here we originally thought was mainly an extremophile until we found it in lots of other places as well. Mm. But there could be Archaea there, but we don't even know that it is yeah. Archaea, if that makes Pretty much. sense. No, no, yeah, I know. This is this is where it start, your head starts to sort of explode a bit. Mm. So I'm thinking about all the, all the possibilities. Like yeah. we can look for some sort of telltales, like if they're producing methane, then we know yeah. that that's probably some form of life sort of thing. But just yeah. in terms of finding it otherwise would be yeah. very hard. And, yeah, uh, and regard... Oh, sorry, continue. No, no, I, I was basically going to ask, is there anything that we can do about this? Uh, or we can't grow them in the lab very easily. Well... Is it just a matter of looking for these primers and the uh, uh, common denominators and sequencing lots of poo? <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> there, is that, there is that possibility, but that's, you know, hard. Time-consuming. There's another, there's another possibility that... Um, there are two possibilities. There's one called metagenomic study, m- metagenomic studies, which don't rely on PCR. So the idea is that it's very expensive and it's very time consuming, but the idea is you actually take DNA from the environment and you assemble it. You actually, you know, you, you piece it back together again and sequence it that way. And then the problem what you run into there is that you run, you know, so uh, theoretically you can grab stuff, you can grab bacteria or archaea or whatever from the environment that you know you can't sequence or you know that you know probably mm. can't be sequenced or grown and you piece it together in on a computer essentially but 
to make any sense of that, you also need to have what's called reference sequence, reference genomes, which is what you were talking about before, the, f- the 50,000 versus 1,000 mm-hmm. that we have in the g- genome database. If you don't have a reference genome, now think of a genome as kind of like a, it's like, it's, they're very structured generally. Like, you know, there's regions for this function, there's regions for that mm-hmm. function. We know enough about it, but we need to have that backbone to assemble unknown sequences over it. And if you don't have right. that, it's extremely difficult to make sense of unknown sequences, especially if they're very, very different from anything we have in the database, which is basically what happens. I mean, you, you had, you, from when I was doing my PhD back about 10 years ago, the, the uh, Craig Vento, I don't know if you've heard, yep. that, heard that name I before. Have, yeah. Yes. Yeah. He, he was, yeah, he was doing these sequencing um, studies of Sarc SOC and all these other different environments. And he was just dumping these, these sequences into GenBank, just, you know, raw sequences and there's no structure to them there's no there's no scaffold so you have no idea what it is it's good as like a you know if you can find a similar sequence go oh craig venter found that i wonder if that's something significant but you don't know what the gene is you don't know what it does you don't know you know you don't know where it exists in context of anything else and that's a real problem so it's great that we have the data there but there's no real way to make sense of it unless you have a reference genome so (laughs) this all sounds very hard it's extremely hard. It's, ex- it's, it's fascinating and it's wonderful, but it's extremely hard. And it's a reason why I think a lot of, um, a lot of our funding agencies are very, very wary of funding this sort of stuff because it's, it's, it, can go in, it can go, you know, into infinity almost, like the mm-hmm. idea of this. And, it's, and where does it end, you know? And uh, the chances of there being anything useful out of it are quite low, I would imagine. Oh, or, yeah. 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 Yeah, I mean, the way you'd you know sell this is to say, oh, we you know we need to find novel um, mm. bi- antibiotics bi- and things, yeah, yeah, pharmaceuticals, whatever, and we can do this by doing this. But yeah, you can, you can, <laughs> it <Maybe>. could happen, <laughs> but is it likely to happen? <laughs> Probably mm. not. Um, so I was this this at the end of this article that Ed sent us about this whole thing. This this this, I, I don't mind saying this sort of took me back. You know, and maybe yearn for the old days when I could when I could sit there and sort of wonder about this sort of stuff. Um, and I found, and, and this article mentions this so-called microbial dark matter project, and what these people are doing essentially is, from what I understand, they're isolating cells one by one and taking those cells, like physically separating them from their cohort. And they're actually sequencing the cell, the DNA in these individual cells. Now that just blows my mind. The fact that, you, that the idea that you can do this is just like, oh my god! Because <laughs> you know, you think about how big a cell is, and think how much, think how hard that would be logistically to do. And then the idea with that, I suppose, is to you know put that into the database and say, okay, well, this is we know this is a cell. We know you know we know mm. what the structure will probably sort of be. We can compare it to a known sequence, and then we can fill up the gaps as they go. But so it's sort God. of it's seeding an encyclopedia of uh, archaea genomes, I guess, with just a little bit of information that we have from sequencing each single cell that yes. we come across. Yes, Which- with the idea that in time people will study another um, or study that particular cell again, and they'll have more information that they can mm-hmm. add to that database later saying. on or something. Yeah. Now that's just that Big honestly, <laughs> yeah. And to be honest, I mean, it makes my skin crawl. The idea of sitting there doing that painstakingly one cell at a time. Oh god! And you know, you yeah. can never know that you haven't got because obviously, like some some. It's funny because if you look at some arch- archaeal cells and some some bacteria, they look very different from your average, you know, little rods that you uh, most bacteria are under the microscope. But most single cell prokaryotes, archaea and bacteria included, are just little rods. And there's no mm. way, um, if you look under the microscope, they look like all little cells and there's no way to tell which one's different and which one's not just by looking at it. So for all you know, you could be sequencing the same damn thing over and over and over <laughs> again. Or you could, you know, luck out and get something totally different. It just, <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the, 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 yeah, the, it, the, the logistics <laughs> of it would be mind-boggling. I don't even want to know how they're... <laughs> and, and good on them, though. I mean, good on it's a yeah. huge, ambitious project, and maybe it's something that can be scaled up. And you have collaborators around the world can do this sort of, you know, in their spare time or something. Maybe and yes. it will grow over the next ten, twenty, thirty years. But uh, good on them for being ambitious. Mm. And good luck to them. Yeah. Now, Penny, one of the great mysteries of Australia is just when, how, and where did humans arrive on this continent? 
We have skeletons and archaeological records going back to 50,000 years ago, but that's about all. But the genomes of 111 Indigenous Australians were published last week, and there's hope that they might give us some clues about that sort of thing. Yeah, and what's interesting is this is not 111 uh, living Australians, but these, are, um, these genomes were published of individuals whose hair was collected between um, 1926 and 1963. So let's hope it was done in a culturally sensitive way. But anyway, mm, the yeah, researchers... Yeah, I'm guessing it wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> anyway, the current researchers uh, went and sp spent some time with the descendants of these people and talked to them about their project, what they were doing, and got permission from all but one of the families to use the hair. So... At least this bit was handled with a little bit more um, respect, cultural sensitivity, respect, mm. whatever you like to call just basic decency. Anyway, <laughs> um, so what's interesting is, as Ed was saying, we've got um, skeletons from about 50,000 years ago and this the DNA collection from the hair, it was a bit hard to get new... They thought they probably wouldn't be able to get... Um, nuclear DNA, which is in the cell nucleus, because the hair was cut with scissors. But the best way to get DNA from hair is, you know, when you pull it out, there's um, the little root. Mm -hmm. So those roots wouldn't be there. So they looked at the mitochondrial DNA. And mitochondrial DNA is often used because not only is it a bit easier to get, it doesn't get muddled up by um, sex, which mixes up DNA, because it's just passed from mother to child. So mm -hmm. all your mitochondrial DNA comes from your mother, not from your father. So you can trace back ancestry. And it also seems to mutate at a reasonably regular rate. So it's known as a molecular clock. So ah. looking at these hair samples, lo and behold, we find, or they found that the owners of the hair samples all probably descended from a common ancestor who lived about 50,000 years ago. Ah. So isn't that nice? When so before 50,000 years ago, yeah. Australia was probably free of humans. Free of Is humans. that what we can assume? Yeah. <laughs> and 50,000 years ago, if you look at the archaeology, that's when we f first find sort of um, evidence of human occupation. Mm -hmm. Sea levels were also low. Australia and New Guinea were a single continent. So, right. And this is where I wish I knew a bit more about um, mitochondrial DNA and what it can tell us because – what their hypothesis is based on mitochondrial DNA is that um, people essentially crossed the land bridge from New Guinea and then just kept to the coastlines and travelled further south. It took only about a 1,000 years to get from far north Queensland down to the south of Australia. But then the mitochondrial DNA evidence apparently suggests that the these people sort of tended to stay where they were. They didn't go on big migrations. And the authors suggest that it's maybe because um, agriculture didn't arise in Australia or not in the sort of the intensive way it did on other continents. So mm -hmm. when you get agriculture, you get, yeah, still largely. Like, I mean, I know that there was evidence of, you know, some farming and management practices, but mm -hmm. not sort of to the extent where you get huge population booms and then a crop fails and everyone moves somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So maybe it was a more stable environment. However, I did archaeology a very, very long time ago. And like I tended, I remember that there was evidence of trading, like stuff from Arnhem Land being found, you know, way down south and but maybe, maybe objects moved and people didn't. I don't know. And I don't know how you can tell that from 111 samples, but maybe you can. Um, but also, yeah, which is, I think we know yeah. linguistically there was a lot of the language mixed around different areas as well. So yeah. I think that there was definitely some degree of movement, maybe not whole fixed tribes or so, but some breakaway tribes must have been moving around and trading i don't know yeah look i don't know either however what is interesting is apparently there was skin cells stuck onto the hair shaft and skin cells will be useful because they could contain nuclear dna so mm -hmm. hopefully mm -hmm. if the descendants of these um people give permission perhaps 
um, analysis of that nuclear gen- DNA, as in our full gen- or their, their full genomes, would help to understand these patterns a bit more. Yeah, it's. Just, I think you know. I, don't, I never want to say, oh, well, that's wrong because it doesn't fit in with what I knew before. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it is interesting to be so different to sort of common knowledge, especially when the first bit seems to confirm what previous lines of evidence had suggested about when humans arrived in Australia. Mm. Anyway, Shane, I, I just think it's kind of interesting. Yeah. So, Shane, did you have something you wanted to say? No, I think we talked over just, you a bit before. No, no, I was just humming because I didn't. <laughs> <know what you're laughs> <interested. laughs> Uh, it, it's pretty cool, and I would assume that the 111 um, samples that they took were from different tribes in different areas around the country, I would hope, because otherwise if you do yeah. it all with one tribe nowadays, it's very possible that they're all from the one um, well, what, what What years were they taking? Ancestor. Were they 1920 to uh, 1960? So okay. I wonder who they were taking from and how they were taking them, yeah. And, and was it a, sorry? I, I must have missed all that. Was it a concerted effort to sample as widely as possible, or was it just a you know we're grabbing samples? I think of, so. A, a, it's, it says because... it was um, anthropological research. So they okay. were collecting information about languages, ceremonies, artwork, and so there and, was a lot of detailed yeah. information and hair. So there was a lot of detailed information collected along with the hair samples. And does any of it correlate? Like it's. It doesn't say. It, it's just said that this was useful because we know sort of where these people were living, where they're – Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And it's not as – because I think, I guess, uh, with the stolen generations, you know, so many people or Aboriginal people are living so far from where their ancestral homes would have been. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Very interesting. But I think uh, that's our show. And if you want any more information about the stories we talked about or if you want to get in touch with us, check out scienceontop.com slash 258. And also our social media information is there and you can leave a comment on the website. And, of course, you can help us out financially by going to scienceontop.com slash donate and joining the throngs of other people throwing money our way to help Mm -hmm. keep us afloat. Thanks for joining me today, Shane and Penny. No worries. Thanks, Ed. This episode was edited with imaginative resourcefulness by Marcos Benamu. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. Hi, Bill Nye. My name is Emra. I had thought I had thought of a time machine that basically ran on all the data based on your brain. So it basically calculated all the information on your brain and all the data in your life. That would, and it would create a vortex which you would go back through and you would go back in time. So it's a time machine. Now, I was thinking that if you went back once, you would have the memory of going back. So that would create another vortex in which you would go through again and you'd and once you got to the dimension which was in the past, the other time machine with your memory would, because you're the person, you it would also form another vortex which would go through and you'd keep going through infinite vortexes until you were lost and come in infinite space and time. Now, I would, my question is would it be possible to generate a, enough electricity to be able to create another vortex which would accelerate time and bring you and generate enough power to bring you back um that all the way back to your time and and keep it stable with all the with the whole time machine and you in it so could you please answer that well, of course, it's a very straightforward question. What? <laughs>